So, can the disease these diet experts tell us, is that really going to decrease our risk of getting cancer? So they have done studies actually looking at this. So they did a study. They looked at 48,000 postmenopausal women who did not have cancer. They randomized them to a low-fat diet versus, with lots of fruit, vegetables, and grain versus control. They didn't do any diet for the other side. And there was no statistical significantly different uh, risk in developing invasive breast cancer following these patients for eight years. Again, they were both less than 1%, half percent. There was another study that actually did show an advantage, um, and it was a small advantage, but this uh, first group of patients, so same, same thing, low fat, high fruit, vegetable, grain diet, what we're all told we should be eating, and in this group of patients who were actually hormone receptor positive, there was no difference in outcomes. In the hormone receptor negative, this is the negative group, there was a difference, but when they looked at that group, that group did lose weight. So is it about weight? Or maybe it's about the metabolic changes that can happen when we lose weight. They did another one right around the same time with the exact same intent, and there was no effect in that group. So one did show a small benefit and one did not. And I will say that on this one, uh, this prior one, they actually really zoomed, if you can see, the, this is not, this is 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. They, they really zoomed in that, that uh, graph so that they could really show you a very infinitesimal difference. But it still is a statistically significant difference. Okay, so then they did a meta-analysis. When I say they, somebody did a meta-analysis. It was published in the British uh, Journal of Nutrition. And they looked at 12 studies in breast cancer patients looking at fruits and vegetables. So there were 41,000 patients. They compared the highest levels of fruits and vegetables and compared it to the lowest intake of fruits and vegetables. And then they looked at it varying different ways because they were trying to find an association. But they couldn't find one, right? So they looked at fruit and vegetables. Then they looked at just vegetables vegetables, and then they looked at cruciferous vegetables, and then they looked at just fruit, and they found no association between any of those intakes and breast cancer prognosis. So what about if we think about it from a completely different way, right? Not about the foods that we're eating, or but, but more about what are we doing to change our metabolism? What are we doing to improve our metabolic health? So if we can come up with a diet that lowers glucose and insulin and insulin-like growth factor, maybe then we can have an impact on cancer. And again, sorry for the, uh, the formatting issues, but this is Dr. Volek's trial looking at patients with metabolic syndrome and putting them on a low carbohydrate versus a low fat diet. And we can see that the dark blue lines are much improved or more improved than any of the light blue lines. And you can see glucose and hidden behind the line says insulin those are significantly more impacted by a low carbohydrate diet than a low fat diet. This was a study that was actually done in cancer patients and these are not, so I'll tell you what these are because these all got messed up, but so these were done in endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer patients. They were put on a ketogenic diet or the American Cancer Society diet and I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but that is a diet that um, is the classic low fat, high grain, high fruit vegetables. Um, you can do fatty fish and olive oil, but it's kind of that Mediterranean low-ish fat diet um, advocating for grains and legumes and things like that. Um, <coughs> and what we see here is that, and I'll go through what these are. So this is total fat mass, so looking at fat mass, not weight, fat mass, so fat mass improved in both groups, right, because the American Cancer Society diet is still good in that it tries to get people off of sugars, it tries to get people off of processed foods, so that is a great first step. Um, visceral fat significantly improved with the ketogenic diet, right, I think we all know that, you know, taking it out of the liver and taking it out of our central obesity is key one. Um, and in these last three groups, uh, we have, if it comes up, so this is glucose, this is insulin, and this is insulin-like growth factor. So I, I always say, if a patient comes to me and really wants to follow a Mediterranean diet, I say, that's great, you're hopefully going to get some good in improvement, but if you want the A-plus train, 
that's not where you want to be. But if you're okay with a B, then, then go for it. <laughs> um, so, so this is a study that was done uh, by Dr. Fine looking at stage four patients. This was a mix of diagnoses. These were patients who were in palliative mode, meaning we were not trying to cure these stage four patients. They were not getting conventional treatment per se. Some of them were, um, these were all, again, just palliative kind of comfort care. What are we gonna do? And what he, so the blue dots are patients who actually had regression or stabilized their disease on imaging. Um, the red is our patients who actually had progressive disease. And uh, he put them on what he called an insulin inhibiting diet. And uh, if I remember correctly, it was about 40 grams of carbohydrate or so, so not necessarily 20 grams of carbohydrate. Um, and this was comparing their, uh, their baseline beta hydroxybutyrate or that ketone body compared to the diet uh, beta hydroxybutyrate and those who raise their beta hydroxybutyrate more had more likely to have the regress disease um, whereas those who had progressive disease did not raise this nearly as much um, calorie deficit so we talk about how sometimes following a ketogenic diet you just eat a little bit less um, there was similar a calorie deficit uh, in both groups and there it was not no difference same with weight change so they might have had weight loss but that didn't really impact whether or not they improved their disease what really seemed to improve their disease I'm going to put up a little bar here on this top right that's where the change in insulin that's where that's one meaning that insulin didn't go down on the right, but insulin did go down on the left. And so those blue circles are mostly to the left where they actually had a change in their insulin over baseline. Oh, and then Dr. Fine on his a blog uh, kind of described what he interpreted from this study. And basically what, which I just described is that the best metabolic response gave the best PET scan response and the worst metabolic response gave the worst PET response. But again, calorie reduction and weight loss did not actually relate to the PET outcomes. So again, it's not about weight loss. It's about who changed their insulin level and who raised their beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, I forget which clicker I need. This is Dr. Sheck's uh, rodent model I don't know if anybody's seen this before maybe you have but I think it's a great illustration why I don't recommend a ketogenic diet for cancer cure um, although who knows maybe we'll get there to some non-toxic non way to cure cancers but these rodents were implanted with a super resistant strain of glioblastoma multiforme and in the top graph they were either uh, treated with a standard diet or a keto cal diet, which is essentially a ketogenic diet for a mouse, although I will tell you it is really not the most healthy ketogenic diet, like there's soybean oil and you know, whatever. So anyway, long story short, you can still see that doing no other treatment other than a ketogenic diet did improve outcomes, but there was probably only like one long-term mousy survivor. Um, <laughs> but, but, it, but it was better than doing nothing. When the normal treatment for glioblastoma multiforme is actually usually a combination of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy called Temidar. Um, but in this group, they did uh, radiation alone. And when we look at the radiation alone arm, so standard diet radiation alone, you can see that at the 50-day mark, you still have about half of the mice alive. But here at the 50-day mark, you really don't have anybody except for maybe this one. So again, radiation still outperforms a ketogenic diet in this population, in this study. But when you combine a ketogenic diet and radiation, they had long-term survivors. And really interestingly, at that point, they were tired of watching their mice live and not get recurrences. So they said, let's put them back on that standard diet and maybe they'll start to recur. And guess what? They didn't, right? They still were living after they put that mouse back on a standard 
diet. So I'm not advocating anybody go back on a Stadner diet, but it still is an interesting uh, piece of evidence. And again, it's mice. It's not humans. We are different than mice, so we cannot take this and run with this. But it certainly provides additional information uh, to say that we're probably on the right track. Um, this is a study that was done in stage four colon cancer. This is in real people. Um, they, uh, they actually put half of their patients on a ketogenic diet. They called it an MCT, so a medium chain triglyceride. You guys might be familiar with that. Um, kind of the coconut oil, super refined. It gets generated right into ketones in the liver. Um, so they called it a modified MCT ketogenic diet versus a control diet while they went through a year of chemotherapy. And you can see that those patients that were on this ketogenic diet had a 61% response rate, meaning that their tumor actually showed response to the chemotherapy compared to only 20% of the control patients. And when they looked at those who had a complete response, meaning they weren't able to find cancer, you can see that that's about a 50% a complete response rate in the ketogenic diet patients and a zero complete response rate in the control patients. So that's pretty dramatic. It didn't mean, I mean, these guys still had a response rate. Um, these guys still had some response rate, but they were partial responders as opposed to complete responders. So what is the best way to lower the risk of developing cancer and improving your cancer outcomes? <coughs> My bias, lower your insulin and improve your metabolic health. They go hand in hand. So don't eat this. <laughs> this is not food. This is fake food. Anything that comes in a box or a bag, you know, it's, and if it does come in a box or a bag, read the label. Um, we should be eating real, whole foods, and we should really be, so this is my thing. I think that everybody, again, has some degree of metabolic dysfunction. So I start, every cancer patient that walks into my office, I, right, they have cancer. They have to have some underlying metabolic dysfunction. I used to say, oh, 20 to 50 carbohydrates, you know, that's good. But a lot of people would start at that 50 and never quite get there. And then you see Fines data where he started people on 40 and maybe they just all didn't get there. So now I just say 20. Everybody start at 20. I don't have to worry about where your magic number is and we can figure that out later. Um, but I really think that everybody should truly know your fasting insulin, your fasting glucose, and your HOMA IR. Just to name a few, I look at a lot more things in myself, but from a clinician in a radiation oncology practice, what can I really look at? If people have labs from their other doctors, I look at everything. I order fasting insulins on everybody now. I unfortunately have patients who don't want to know, don't want, you know, talk to the hand, the head's not listening, but, um, but those that are interested, um, we do, we can get a lot of information from that. Um, I always say, cons you know, use a glucose monitor, take your own glucose measurements. If you can get a continuous glucose monitor from your physician, I would strongly encourage it, even if you don't have a diagnosis, if they're willing to write you a prescription and you pay out of pocket, they're not that expensive if you get the Freestyle Libre. Um, the Dexcom's very expensive, um, apparently a little more accurate, but my thing is it's really just to look at trends. You know, I, I actually am wearing one right now because I had um, four different talks and three, you know, two flights and a, no, a late night and a yeah, I had a really stressful week, so I don't expect my glucose to change ever from my eating habits, but I'm trying to understand how does stress and travel and those things play into um, my own glucose. So far, I'll just let you all know, it's been pretty flatlined for that too. Um, but I really think that, that if you don't test, you don't know. And the more information that you have, the more educated decisions that you are making. Um, and if you've got your diet um, dialed in, these are like the, the little, you know, icing on the cake, but we should never say, uh, the butter on the steak, how's that? Um, so, so 
I, I'm a little bit of a stickler, so I have found patients who their metabolic profile looks pretty good, but they're still having some health-related issues, and I'm trying to figure it out, and I've run omega-3, omega-6 checks on them, and I find that their omega-6s are out of whack, so even though they're eating keto, they're doing too many salad dressings that have the soybean or canola oils in them. So really looking at this, um, also, you know, getting like getting overboard in the nut butters and things like that can can uh, bump these up. Um, we already have heard time restricted feeding and intermittent fasting can provide some additional lowering of uh, insulin levels, um, quality sleep and circadian rhythm, um, exercise hit. So there's an, a really great study. It's a small study, college study, because it's easy to get college kids to do studies for you, right? You pay them. But um, this was in a group of women who didn't exercise. Um, and they compared uh, HIT exercise to control, so still don't exercise, and, uh, and uh, cardio exercise. And the HIT actually had, I think, like three times the reduction in fasting insulin levels. So three times. So all it is is if you want to go for a walk, that's great, but run across the streets <laughs> or run mailbox to mailbox or something where you're just getting your heart rate up and then letting it come back down. What does HIT mean? HIT, sorry, high intensity interval training. Okay, good. And some people will call it variable heart rate training. So really you're just trying to vary it, not chronic steady state. Manage stress, I, this is one I need to work on, just if anybody else, so high stress. So stress, you know, work on breathing exercises, meditation, really trying to get out of that sympathetic state, which we all seem to be in because we're running from work to kids' practices, to trying to get dinner on the table, to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, see, I knew I was gonna get. So sunlight, so uh, just being out in nature, being away from the blue lights. Um, we know vitamin D deficiencies are associated with cancers. Um, so making sure that we're not necessarily slathering up with sunscreen and staying shaded and under an umbrella. Like, go outside, get some sun. Don't burn. I did burn at the lake this week because I hadn't seen the sun a long time, so I hope that won't kill me. I feel like if I'm in ketosis, I'm, I'm like protected, right? Um, but, but again, being outside, so the more you can experience nature, um, the better. And then again, Thank you for all being here. This is our community. It makes us feel like we're not alone um, and it gives us great social connections. So please introduce yourself to your neighbor. Um, hopefully you live close by each other. Maybe you can uh, do some things together. Uh, when you go out and socialize, it's easier to do those things with people of like mind. Um, and again, laughter, it still is the best medicine.